We are a couple of years before the outbreak of the First World War. The scene memorably painted in poems and novels and film retrospectives, the endless summer before the deluge. And we're in East Sussex, you know, a bucolic pastoral part of England near the village of Piltdown. And as the Manchester Guardian is telling its liberal-minded readers, somebody has turned up an extraordinary find, the this skull of a prehistoric man. So actually, the summer of 1912 was notoriously dreadful. The entire cricket season was pretty much rained off. Oh, what a tragedy. That's why I know about it. What a tragedy. <laughs> um, but th there is kind of light amid the gloom and th there is the huge excitement of this incredible paleontological discovery. Um, and uh, a, a prehistoric skull, but there's also a jawbone. There are teeth. There are primitive tools. And the very excitingly, the skull seems to be kind of humanoid, like resembling that of a, a modern human with a brain size, perhaps two thirds that of a modern human right. is the estimate. Yeah. But the jawbone is more like that of a chimpanzee. So it's pilt down man, as this, this creature comes to be called, seems to be a missing link kind of halfway between modern humans and uh, no, chimpanzee. No, no wonder the Guardian was so excited. Yeah, very, very exciting. And in fact, it's so exciting that there's a painter called um, John Cook, who in 1915, he he does this kind of very dramatic portrayal of all the various figures involved in the discovery, the scientists and so on. And they're in a room, crouched over a table, gazing at the various fragments of the of the bones. And on the back behind them, there is a picture of the greatest of all English biologists and scientists, Charles Darwin. Right, and so this is reflection of the way in which, uh, you know, by now nineteen fifteen, of course, it's the, the the Great War has broken out, but it remains a source of enormous national pride because it seems to back up Darwin's theories, and Darwin, of course, is English, but also this skull and the Guardian is very keen on this, pointing it out. It's much older than the skull of the Neanderthal man, which is German, so. Hooray for England. We've got an older skull than the Germans have got. And what's even better is that, so Piltdown Man is he's described as the first Englishman, but it, it suggests that um, humans themselves may have evolved in England. So in other words, Tom, humanity didn't just reach its, its final and most perfected form in England. It, it also originated in England. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, there's a connection there because um, presumably if, you know, the first the first uh, advanced humans emerge in England, that explains why people in England are so much more advanced than everywhere else. Well, this, so, this seems like a, I think we should end the episode right there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, unfortunately, mm. there is a slight shadow over this story because, oh, no. um, of course, the discovery of Piltdown Man is announced, as we've said, in 1912. And regular listeners to our podcast will remember that another great event happens in 1912, <laughs> namely the, the sinking of Titanic. And it has to be said that I think that there are kind of certain parallels between the two stories. So in both cases, you have enormous patriotic excitement. Um, but perhaps a quality of excitement that that suggests a certain nervousness about foreign competition. It was the Germans, isn't as it? As much as anything. It was the Germans. Yes. Well, and Americans too, as we'll see. Um, and the, the Titanic, of course, goes on to hit the iceberg. And not to give away too big a spoiler, but Piltdown Man will um, ultimately turn out not entirely to be what it's facing an iceberg of its own Tom. i think it is it is the iceberg of scientific skepticism in due course will send it down to the icy depths so teasing out that kind of comparison with the titanic before we come to the story of of how piltdown man came to be found who found it uh, and all of that um maybe it would be good just to look at, at what reason in 1912 british scientists have to uh to be lacking in self-confidence. Lacking in self-confidence. Because as with the Titanic, Britain, you know, Britannia rules the waves. But by 1912, there's a certain nervousness about whether Britain is being overtaken by the Americans and by the Germans. So similarly, as with industrialization and as with sea power, so to an extent with natural history, Britain had established a, a, a massive early lead that is now starting to, to kind of slightly uh, shrink. So... 
Britain's lead in natural history is established in all kinds of ways at the beginning of the 19th century. So um, most excitingly for me, Britain is the first country to excavate and identify dinosaurs. And one of the earliest dinosaurs is actually found in Sussex. Um, and it's it found in, uh, in the 1820s by a doctor from Lewis in Sussex called Gideon Mantell, who excavates and identifies a dinosaur that comes to be called Iguanodon. Right. Britain is also the first country to build a national museum devoted to natural history, which opens in 1881. And when it opens, it's it's called the British Museum brackets natural history. It's now today it's known as the the, the, the natural history museum, but it's it's this massive cathedral. I yeah. mean, every, basically every British child probably will have have visited it, and it's constructed to convey a sense of of grandeur and awe and splendour that reflects well on Britain. And now, of course, Tom, people are uh, campaigning for them to for the artifacts to be given back to the dinosaurs, aren't they? <laughs> are they, Dominic? Are they? You can take the boy out of the Daily Mail, but. Um, and of course, Britain, uh, as every visitor to the Natural History Museum sees, because there's a huge statue of him in prime in pole position, um, has Charles Darwin, who we mentioned is the greatest bio biologist of his age, origin of species, theory of, of evolution by natural selection, and so on. And his perhaps his most controversial book is a book called The Descent of Man, which comes out in 1871 which advances the theory that Darwin had been too nervous to introduce in The Origin of Species, that humans, just like every other animal, are a product of evolution. And so this opens up all kinds of, of tantalizing and sensitive questions, um, among which is the question of, you know, is there a single human race or are there multiple races? Um, Darwin himself thinks that that all humans belong to the, the the same race, has the same origin point, but it it kind of encourages Darwin's peers to view human history as as a kind of struggle. So this will go on to have very very dark implications with with the Nazis and so on. But these ideas are kind of percolating around long before before the Nazis. So famously, it's not Darwin who comes up with the phrase um, "survival of the fittest," but the um, uh, Herbert Spencer, yeah, and he writes the survi this survival of the fittest, which I have here sought to express in mechanical terms, is that which Mister Darwin has called natural selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. And so, this, of course, is very, very flattering to the British, who at the time count themselves the top nation. They've produced the top scientist. It's all great, but of course, it, there is also a warning, which is what happens if they start falling behind in the the struggle for life. You know, will they will they be history? Yeah, of course. So this is all kind of part of the the kind of the the intellectual background, um, and certainly there are alarming signs in the field of natural history that Britain's lead is starting to slip. So to look, for example, at uh, dinosaurs, you love dinosaurs. Britain, <laughs> much more spectacular finds have be, uh, are being uncovered in in the continent, for instance. So in 1878. Uh, the Iguanodon, which M Mantel had found in Sussex, um, an incredible find is made in Belgium, in the town of Bernissar, mm -hmm. where dozens of Iguanodons, I mean, 29, I think, in total, are found down a mine shaft. Um, and in America, the finds are even larger. And the most famous of these, which again, anyone who's been to the Natural History Museum will remember, is this huge cast of a Diplodocus, which has been excavated by Andrew I'm, Carnegie. I'm just going to say it, it's a Diplodocus. <laughs> All right. Okay. Been dug up in America. Andrew Carnegie, this this Scot uh, turned American monopolist, the richest man in the world. He makes a cast of it and gives it back to the Natural History Museum. So it's a kind of uh, it's it's like the Titanic, Dominic. It's it's a kind of Anglo-American fusion. It's an attempt to build a sense of Atlantic identity that nevertheless makes the British feel slightly like they're being put in the shade by by um, American advances. And then, of course, you have human fossils. And this is very much a live area, not least because of, of, of Darwin's book about it. But the idea that humans have evolved, you need fossil evidence for it. And this has begun to appear over the course of the second half of the 19th century. So in 1856, a, a skull has been found in the Neander Valley, the Neander Tal, so that's where the name of Neanderthal man comes from, and that's German. 1868, um, a prehistoric Homo sapiens has been found at, at the Cro-Magnon. Is that a place? Cro-Magnon is. is a place. Who knew? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've learned something. I'm I'm absolutely thrilled with that. <laughs> 
And then in 1886, um, some Neanderthal skulls are found in Belgium. So Germany, France, Belgium. Who would have imagined that they would be full of Neanderthals, Tom? But Dominic, nothing in Britain. That does so not Britain surprise lacks, me. lacks a prehistoric man. Yeah, and no this is a massive, massive sore point for British scientists. And there's a kind of an additional complication, an additional reason why British scientists are getting a bit antsy is that in 1891, there'd been a very, very controversial find made outside Europe in Java, so in Indonesia, um, by a Dutch expedition. And they'd found the remains of what the, the discovery is called Java Man, which seems to be a kind of human ape missing link. And Java Man is bipedal, so it seems to walk on you know two feet, mm. but it has a very small skull. And European scientists are very skeptical about this and they insist it's not human at all that it's just an ape because their assumption is that big brains come first and then walking on two feet and it's this and the reason that they argue this is chiefly because it then enables them to argue that based on the fossil evidence of the neanderthals and the cro-magnons mm. that humans originated in europe um, because at this point, there is no evidence at all that humans have originated in Africa, even though actually Darwin thinks that they did because that's where all the apes are found. And this is important for kind of European self-esteem because um, it enables them to explain why Europeans are the most advanced of races. Because born, they, they were it. born first and they're, they're further along. That's basically the claim, is it? That's basically I'm slightly claim. baffled about yeah. the, the bipedalism and why that matters. So what's the... Because, because the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons are bipedal and they have relatively large heads. So, so the Java man, if it's bipedal and has a small head, that suggests that it might... Uh, uh, that, that therefore the um, humans would have originated outside Europe. That and that sense? can't be true. So, well, they don't want to believe that because they want to believe that the European that humans emerged in Europe, because right. it then enables them to argue that Europeans are the most superior race. So they're saying, okay, sure, there's a fellow walking around on two feet, but he's got a tiny brain, so he doesn't count. Basically, that, is that it's basically a monkey. Saying? Yeah, it's okay. a monkey. Yeah. It's an ape. It's it's nothing to do with humans. Right, that's their argument, and it's a, it's an argument that is clearly driven basically by racism. Okay, and by a sense of European superiority, and that in turn explains why. British scientists are desperate to find human fossil remains in Britain and particularly human fossil remains that have big skulls because both national and racial pride is essentially riding on it. So the bigger the head, the better. The bigger the head, the more British, the better it is. I've got a massive head, Tom, if that's any uh, inspiration <laughs> well, to you. That, well, there you go. I that's, have to have like a uh, baseball cap or something in a special size because my head is so big. Massive brain. And you're bipedal. Yeah. So, well, brilliant. sometimes. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, so basically, this is the kind of the 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 context for the sensational discovery announced in the Guardian, right? And it's why the Guardian is so keen on emphasising that the skull is big. So the Guardian doesn't say who has found it; it just says there has been a find no. in, in Piltdown in Sussex. Yes. But I think I'm right in saying that that a month later, the two blokes who have found it pitch up at the Geological Society in London. Um, and say, here we are, and this is the amazing finding. And who are they? As you say, two people kind of jointly make this presentation um, on the, the 18th of December, 1912. And um, the first person there is the guy who had made the initial find. He, he discovered a fragment of, of, of skull at Piltdown. And this is a guy called Charles Dawson. And he is actually not a scientist at all, but a country solicitor. Uh, and he has his practice in Uckfield, uh, not far from Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, I gather, uh, Dawson Hart and company solicitors can still be found. So okay. that's very exciting. Let's hope that this story um, inspires confidence in them, Tom. <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's hope. Um, so Charles Dawson, it, it, basically, he, he has the look of um, a, a boiled egg with a moustache. Okay, um, like Hercule Poirot. Very like Hercule Poirot. Um, he's, he's in appearance, he's kind of very jovial. There's a faint twinkle in his eye, as he's often said. Love it. Um, the scientists who work with him on Piltdown Man all think he's great. So one of them describes him as a delightful colleague. Another says of him, he's always cheerful, hopeful, and overflowing with enthusiasm. And his wife, uh, they have a very happy marriage. She, she says of him that he's the best and kindest man who ever lived. So if the so listeners that's... want to kind of um, aid memoir, he's very like me. <laughs> 
Yes. Are you a, a boiled egg with a moustache? I don't have a moustache. Grow a moustache, I suppose. No. no. Let's keep on Charles Dawson, because um, as well as looking like a boiled egg with a moustache, he's also distinguished for his insatiable curiosity about every aspect of the natural history and history and archaeology of Sussex, which is a country very rich in all three of those things. So he is a leading light of um, Dominic the 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 country's oldest county archaeological society, which is the Sussex Archaeological Society, it's still going strong, a tremendous organization. Um, and like Gideon Mantell, the discoverer of the Iguanodon, he lives in Lewis and specifically in um, a very grand house at the foot of Lewis Castle called Castle Lodge. So he's very much at the heart of Sussex's history. And over the course of his career, he has made a succession of absolutely amazing discoveries. So He's found fossils like Mandel had done. Mm -hmm. And specifically, he had discovered the tooth of a previously unknown species of mammal from the Cretaceous period, which is the last of the three periods of the, the, the age of the dinosaurs. Um, he's discovered lots of antiquities and all of these have kind of shed intriguing and un unexpected light on obscure periods of, of history. So he's found a, a Roman statuette that is made of of um, cast iron rather than wrought iron, which is what you would expect. Yeah, because um, it is it is assumed that cast iron techniques had only developed in England in the 14th century. So to discover that the Romans had had been on it's top brilliant of it to is, have overturned you know, it's an amazing yeah, find, a conventional uh, wisdom of academics, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, and Dawson has also found a brick from Pevensey, which is stamped with what seems to be the the very last datable Roman inscription ever found in Britain. So that again is is amazing. Um, he's found um, a, a stone axe. He's found the remains of an ancient boat. So all incredible, lots more on uh, along those lines. And he's also very keen on natural wonders of which the most extraordinary is um, a toad that has been mummified inside stone. So uh, extraordinary. Wow. Um, How can that even Amazing happen? wonder. I'm curious about that, but we'll put it on to one side, I suppose. I'm not... But not the rest is, well, is toads. It, it, it's 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 just a kind of slew of amazing things that he's discovered that has won him um, uh, lots of uh, honours. So he's been um, elected to the Society of Antiquaries in London, like me. <laughs> right, um, you're kind of very and, similar. Uh, I mean, similar kind of um, <laughs> yeah, forensic well, attention to detail and um, authenticity. Yeah. Right, we will we will see. Um, and in Sussex. He's hailed by the local press as the wizard of Sussex for his almost supernatural ability to pluck these incredible finds right. um, as if from nowhere. So amazing. And uh, his renown is such that basically, I, I don't know when he has time to do his soliciting. I mean, he's doesn't seem to be yeah. very keen on the law at all um, because he's he's hanging out with all kinds of luminaries. So one of these, perhaps the most distinguished of these luminaries, is a man called Arthur Smith Woodward. And he is the keeper of geology at the Natural History Museum. And he, Dominic, is a world expert on fossil fish. God, he sounds such an interesting man, Tom. Well, he, he, he is because he's not just an expert on fossil fish. He is also um, sufficiently brilliant that he is the guy who Dawson gives the um, Cretaceous mammal tooth to, which he'd found back in 1891. And um, Woodward had been very excited about it and, re and realized that it was a hitherto unknown species. Um, and so since then, they've become great friends. Yeah. Uh, Dawson is, is always getting in touch with Woodward to tell him about his, his latest finds. Um, and what's impressive about this friendship is that Woodward is not a very, he's not a very clubbable man. He's um, he's very tall. He's gaunt. He's fussy. He's acerbic. <laughs> Tom, this is unbelievable. This is the podcast. <laughs> That's he, what it he is. Has a, he, he has a thin goat-like beard. I mean, it's, which I, it's uncanny. Which, it's which, uncanny. Which I, which I absolutely don't. And actually, Dominic, he's not like me. He's like um, he's like Professor Summerlee in The Lost World by, Conan Doyle. by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, um, which uh, I'm sure lots of people have, have, have read. But if you haven't, it was published in 1912, so the same year that yeah. Piltdown Man was found. And it describes an expedition of two scientists one of whom is Professor Summerlee, a journalist and a, and a big game hunter, to go and discover a lost world in South America. What an amazing a, coincidence plateau. that uh, the lost world was published, <laughs> well, presumably yeah. just months before this discovery. 
it uh, yes it is a, it is a coincidence uh not least because as well as dinosaurs the lost world features ape men who are cast as missing links right and what is it even more of a coincidence is that the author sir arthur conan doyle who of course is also the author of sherlock holmes lives some eight miles from piltdown so conan doyle's a great walker that's very much within walkable distance for him um, and Conan Doyle has met both Dawson and Woodward because Conan Doyle, I mean, he's interested in everything, basically mm. very interested in palatology. He'd found some dinosaur footprints and he'd, he got Dawson over to have a look at them. Um, and they've become sufficiently good friends that in November, 1911, Conan Doyle invites Dawson and his wife for lunch. So they go over, um, and almost certainly at this lunch, they discuss missing links conan doyle seems to have told dawson about his plans for the lost world right and after the discovery is made after the finding of piltdown man um, dawson writes to woodward huge excitement conan doyle has written and seems excited about the skull he has kindly offered to drive me in his motor anywhere so conan doyle is also part of the uh, the piltdown man set yeah the piltdown sets very good so how had dawson actually come to find the skull itself so at this meeting on the 18th of December, 1912, at the Geological Society, he gives um, his first account of, of what had happened. And he reports that uh, workmen had been working in a gravel pit in Piltdown. And because they knew of his reputation as someone interested in such things, they had given him a small piece of bone that the workmen had found in the pit. And at this meeting, Dawson is very vague as to when exactly this had happened. So... I mean, it could have been any time, you know, from kind of 1899 onwards. But the next morning, it's reported that he had said that he had been given this in 1908. So that's well, four years hanging before. On, hanging on to this bit of skull for four years. I suppose you might. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And the reason for this, he says, is that um, it was only a fragment and that the workmen had said that they had originally found a much larger skull, which they had then smashed because they thought that it was a coconut. <laughs> Coconut in Sussex. A coconut, a fossil coconut in Sussex. Okay. Yes. This is what Dawson supposedly said. And so therefore, knowing this, Dawson is looking, he's going to the quarry looking for the other fragments of this, this skull that has been smashed by the workmen. And over the course of the four years, if it is four years, he's gradually found them and he's pieced them together and it makes a kind of an entire cranium of an unusual thickness, so much thicker than a normal skull would be. Yeah. And by 1912, he is, you know, he's ready basically to announce it to the world. And so he writes a letter to Woodward telling him about, about Conan Doyle and about the lost world and how it's coming out. And then he just, he, this kind of casual mention, he says, I found a portion of a human skull and he compares it to a Neanderthal skull, which of course, to any British scientist is an absolute way of saying I might have found a British Neanderthal skull. Yeah, it's so I exciting. So a, exciting. You know, we, we can put the Germans in, in the shade here. And Woodward is certainly intrigued by this, but he doesn't actually get down to Piltdown for quite a while. And this is partly because, as I said, the weather is so bad. Uh, and it's also because you know he's a busy man. He's in charge of an entire department in the Natural History Museum. Doesn't have the time. And it's clear that that. Dawson is getting a bit impatient about this. He wants to show off his discovery. So on the 24th of May, he goes to Woodward and he shows him all the fragments of the skull. And Woodward is pretty excited now. So on the 2nd of June, he joins Dawson at Piltdown to start on the excavations. And it's brilliantly Edwardian that the first day, they don't get much done because they're having a huge picnic. Very, uh, yeah, which, very wind in the willows. Yes, lattice pork pies and lemonade and all that kind of thing. So they they start their excavations and they don't find they don't really find anything to begin with. They're kind of sifting through all the um, both the quarry itself, but all the the, the 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 piles of of kind of refuse that the workmen have left, because presumably this is where other bits might be. And they're working and working and working. And then on the 23rd of June, so that's basically three weeks of working, and they're not working all the time. They're mainly working at the weekends. Dawson finds this jaw, the jaw that looks like a, a chimpanzee jaw, and it fits, supposedly, it seems, with the, with the skull. And over the course of July, they find uh, shaped flints. So these are the tools that presumably is you know, been used by the Piltdown man and bones of various prehistoric animals that kind of enable them to date it as being much further back in time than Neanderthal man. So clearly this, this man is much older than the German 
fossil man. So, you know, this is brilliant. And it is Woodward who's been working with Dawson throughout the summer, who joins Dawson at the meeting of the Geological Society. And this is crucial for the uh, repute of what is being said, because Dawson is actually, had actually become president of the Geological Society in 1904. And it's his prestige, of course, that makes the news of the discovery echo around Britain, across the world. And brilliantly, from Dawson's point of view, it is uh, Woodward who pays tribute to the role that he's played in the discovery of this amazing find by giving Piltdown Man the official scientific name of Eo Anthropus Dawsoni, so Dawson's Dawn Man. So, you know, he now has this incredible fossil named after him. So it's an amazing story about this kind of amateur um, archaeologist and kind of antiquarian, you know, in, in the English countryside who's teamed up with a, with a, a really well-respected scientific mind and together they have revolutionized the way people think about um life on earth they have and but but also they have they've shown that the tradition that the gideon mantel had embodied the, the you know the doctor who goes out and finds a dinosaur that that tradition is still absolutely living and valid in the fields of sussex a yeah. hundred years on yeah and it's a reassurance to the british you know that they're still the cutting edge they're still top nation so greeted with huge enthusiasm and so unsurprisingly you know, excavations resume the following year, all the way through 1913, through the summer of 1914, even Dominic as the storm clouds of war are gathering. Yeah. And various further finds are made. So nasal bones, which I gather are very important, and a, a canine, you know, a tooth. Right. Um, which, uh, again, is apparently very significant for reasons I don't entirely understand. Um, and by this point, there's pretty much widespread acceptance of Woodward's arguments, the, particularly that the jaw and the skull go together. There are scientists in America, particularly, who argue that perhaps they're, you know, they're different species who've been jumbled up. But most people accept, particularly in Europe, that this proves that um, the, the the big the big brain evolved before bipedalism. Right. So, so even the Germans. It's basically, uh, yeah, uh, even the Germans. It's what they basically they've all been kind of looking for. Yeah. Now. There are, of course, um, a, a couple of possible clouds on the horizon, um, possible indications that not everything is is quite what it seems. Uh, and the first of these happens in late June 1914. So, you know, the build up to the First World mm. War. And a particular moment that, that Woodward describes in his brilliantly titled book, The Earliest Englishman. I was watching the workman who was using a broad pick or mattock when I saw some small splinters of bones scattered by a blow, I stopped his work and searching the spot with my hands, pulled out a heavy blade of bone of which he had damaged the end. Oh. And there's something very weird about this heavy blade of bone, which Woodward himself in his book um, points out, which is that it looks exactly like a cricket bat. I mean, made of stone. Eerily, eerily made of, made of, yes, made of, uh, of uh, elephant bone. Um, so, you know, what's, what was, what was, what was Piltdown Man doing with a cricket bat? I mean, it's, it's, it's a question that the outbreak of war kind of slightly buries. Just a coincidence, other, Tom. It's just, a, yeah. Just an accident. And, and, th and then there's another coincidence, which happens two years later in August, 1916, which is very sadly, Dawson dies. He's only 52, dies of pernicious anemia. And... From that point on, no further fossils are found at the site. None at all. And none at all. And again, possible cause to raise an eyebrow there. But most people agree, don't they, that um, there's no cause for alarm or suspicion about any of this, that clearly it, this is a tremendous find. Um, it's been authenticated by absolutely top people. And it, and it shows beyond any real doubt that the very first sort of recorded human beings, what we can say human beings, originated, as many of us have long believed, in England. <laughs> in Sussex. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and this is pretty much taken for granted, particularly in Britain, of course. Um, and so this influences how subsequent finds are interpreted. So in 1924, an amazing fi find is made in a, a South African cave and it's um, a very small ape-like bipedal human-like creature 
that will go on to be called Australopithecus. Um, and again, this confirms what the Java man specimen had seemed to suggest that um, bipedalism evolved first and then the larger brains came later, which of course is exactly the contrary to what Piltdown Man suggests. And so British scientists in the 1920s basically ignore the evidence of Australopithecus um, uh, because it doesn't tally with, with, with the evidence of, of Piltdown Man. But as the decades go by, more and more finds are made in Africa, in, uh, in China, all of which support the thesis that you know, it's, it's the bipedalism that comes first. And as a result of that, Piltdown Man comes to be seen as a kind of weird aberration, um, maybe a separate line of development yeah. um, to the mainstream the of, English, of human evolution. Perhaps the first Britons, yeah. Tom, evolved yeah, separately from the rest of the human race. Maybe, maybe. but it, it's, it's, it's still not seen as a fake. And then in 1953, so I mean, that's you know, decades on from yeah, the- Yeah, uh, 40 years from, on. You know, 40 years. A bombshell. So 23rd of November, this report appears in The Guardian. Recent improvements in the technique of fluorine analysis made possible some of the tests which led three scientists to conclude that the mandible and canine tooth of the Piltdown skull were, quote unquote, deliberate fakes. <gasps> what a And more shock. finally, the report that The Guardian is quoting there had appeared in the Bulletin of the British Museum of Natural History. So the house journal of the museum in which Woodward himself was the, the, head, the head of geology. And the report does its best to exonerate the, the scientists who had claimed that Piltdown Man was authentic. So it says the problem was not capable of solution on the available evidence, i.e. back in 1912. And the perpetration of the hoax seems to have been so entirely unscrupulous and inexplicable as to find no parallel in the history of paleontological discovery. And today in 2024, chiefly thanks to dating techniques that weren't available in 1912, mm. we know that the skull that was found by Dawson, the thick skull was actually medieval and that its thickness was due to uh, a condition called Paget's disease, which is a kind of hereditary thickening of the bone, that the jaw came from an orangutan and it wasn't even Piltdown man, it was Piltdown woman because the orangutan was female and that the teeth which had been found had been filed down to make them look more human. They were kind of um, orangutan teeth. So the Guardian said, uh, the perpetration of the hoax seems to have been so entirely unscrupulous and inexplicable. Unscrupulous, I mean, if the teeth are literally being filed down to make them look more yeah. human, um, there's, it's clearly been... Uh, carefully conceived and cold-bloodedly carried out. But the question is, by whom? So who who planted this evidence? So the, the first mystery, what, you know, what was pulled our man, is now solved. But that leaves the other mystery, who was the fraudster? Who was the hoaxer? Yeah. And there have been, as you can imagine, all kinds of theories over the years. So one theory is that it was, um, you know, it was someone who wasn't even involved in the dig who basically just did it for the bants right. because um, this is a golden age of Hoaxes. great British hoaxsters. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the greatest of them all is a man called Horace Devere Cole, uh, generally reckoned, I think, to be Britain's greatest prankster. Um, and he was uh, he, very posh, kind of Anglo-Irish aristocrat, Old Etonian, went to Trinity College, Cambridge, officer in the Boer War. But he was also, um, he was very, very Justin Trudeau. Right. He was a, a great man for, for the blackface. Um, <laughs> and he was basically, like Justin Trudeau, he, yeah. he, he couldn't stop himself. He was always <laughs> doing it. it. So as an undergraduate, he, he dressed up as the uncle of the Sultan of Zanzibar, who was visiting London at the time. Yeah. Um, and he paid his own college at Trinity a ceremonial visit. And no one spotted him. No one unmasked him. No, no, one, no one spotted him. And then... Um, in 1910, he did it again to even more spectacular effect. His uh, ceremonial visit to the college he'd done with his best friend, who was called um, Adrian Stephen. Mm. And uh, in 1910, he teams up with Adrian Stephen again and with Adrian Stephen's sister, Virginia, who, of course, Dominic, uh, yeah. in due course, will become Virginia Woolf. Not a friend of the rest hero. of history. So the three of them, actually a few more, they all, um, they all dress up as a, an official delegation from Abyssinia and are received by the captain of HMS Dreadnought, 
um, they were kind of welcomed aboard and shown round. And um, again, it's a, it's a, a, a tremendous coup. Um, oh, but the for fact any that prankster. Virginia Woolf is in blackface, Tom, very on brand for her, isn't it? But uh, it has to be said that um, it doesn't really seem to be a Cole style because he's he's essentially a man for a stump. Yeah, he's a kind of jape for a hoax, and they involve basically him blacking up. No, not exclusively. There's an, also there's a very good story that he has a bet with a friend of his who's a kind of a fellow MP that um, he'll be able to beat him in a in a race, uh, even though he gives him a ten meter start. And so they agree. The bloke you know has a ten meter start running down Piccadilly. Um, and uh, Devere Cole shouts out, that man's stolen my watch, and he's planted his watch in the man's coat. So he gets arrested by the policeman, and Devere Cole is able to win his race. So it's that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly, but that's the that point. Kind of he's, he's involved in the stunt. Yeah. So if he'd blacked up and laid in the ground and claimed and <laughs> yes. allowed himself to be dug yes. up, I would believe it. But <laughs> yes. the, the sort of very methodical nature of this and the planning yeah, it long in advance is not his style, is it? Right. So maybe it's you want someone who's fascinated by paleontology and ape men. Yeah. Uh, maybe has a medical background, all that stuff about teeth, and, yeah. you know, nasal bones and so on. And someone who's on the scene. And if you throw into the mix the fact that perhaps this someone has published a novel which comes out the same year that Piltdown Man has been found and features people going and looking for ape men. You might point the finger of suspicion at Sir Arthur Conan <gasps> Doyle. And in fact, yes. people, you know, when, when it's discovered that um, Piltdown Man has been faked, they go to the Lost World and they read it through and they find all kinds of what seem to be kind of giveaway lines. So, so there's this, um, in the novel, the narrator meets with a sceptical friend of his at the beginning of the book where they're wondering whether the Lost World really exists. And this sceptical friend says, if you are clever and you know your business, you can fake a bone as easily as you can a photograph. Oh, come on, that's a giveaway. That's got to be a giveaway. And there's more. Well, Dominic, there's more. You remember the, the mysterious elephant bone that looks like a cricket bat? Yeah. Conan Doyle was a very good cricketer. And very keen on it. It's yeah, kind of he, joke he would have enjoyed. Race out in a first class match. Um, so and I guess good. the question is Conan Doyle doesn't have a reputation as a great hoaxer. He has a reputation actually as a victim of hoaxes because of obviously the fairies, photographs. Well, basically, he believes everything. And he believes in spiritualism. He's always going to seances and he does. nonsense like that. So, why would he therefore be. Car I mean, him carrying out the hoax seems like an odd. Unless he's got but, some. Well, the theory, is, the, the, the theory is, is that he wants revenge on the scientific establishment for mocking spiritualism. Okay, I find that not entirely implausible. <laughs> Do you? It's it is. It's completely implausible. Why? I mean, it's a mad. It's a mad theory. Well, I quote Stephen Jay Gould, yeah. the great, the great uh, uh, bi evolutionary biologist. What can one say of an evidence-free argument based on speculations about motive? Well, you can say it sounds very plausible, like I've just done. I mean, just because Stephen Jay Gould <laughs> thinks it's implausible, you haven't convinced no, it's me. It's completely implausible. It's absolutely not the kind of thing that Conan Doyle would have done, because as you said, he has no re no background as a hoaxer, and he is. Absolutely the kind of person who would be hoaxed. So I think, well, let's say that there are more plausible candidates to have. Let's hear them. So let's look at some of them. So what about one of the scientists studying yeah. uh, Piltdown Man? So there have been various suggestions. So there's a guy called Arthur Keith, who was a very celebrated anatomist, anthropologist. Uh, he was head of the Hunterian. Um, and he'd begun, he'd started out very sceptical about Piltdown Man. He'd then become, he'd swung massively behind it, huge enthusiast for the idea that, that it was authentic. And then when presented with the evidence in 1953, accepted that it was a fake. He's all over the place, this guy. I mean, he is know all he over the place. He is all over the place. And so it has been suggested that this is a deliberate attempt to kind of obfuscate. Again, I, I think it's implausible. Then there's there's um, an extraordinary character called uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a, a French Jesuit Darwinist okay. paleontologist. It's, it's definitely him. There's no question <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> so as a young man, he'd been posted to Sussex, yeah, you know, by the by the Jesuit superior, and because he was so interested in paleontology and everything, he he you know he's, he'd been fascinated by Piltdown and come and joined the dig in 1912. So he was one of you know, he joined Woodward and, and Dawson. French, such French behaviour, like dropping little bits of other bones <laughs> in the thing while he's pretending to dig. I can see it now. Yeah, and he would go on. He would he, he was involved in a dig that found um, uh, um, a, a, a relate a kind of a, a, a Java man equivalent in China. Right. Peking man, as it was called. So he does have 
I, I can't quite remember what the reasons are for thinking that he might have done it, but there are people who think that he that he did it. And then some people have even suggested Arthur Smith Woodward, even though obviously he comes out of the whole affair looking an absolute idiot. Yeah, a gaunt, again, I don't believe a is, gaunt tall man would have done it, Tom. With a, with a beard like a goat. There's actually, so there's no evidence that any of these people were involved in it. And in fact, there is only one scientist who, who does seem to have questions to answer. And this is a man called Martin Hinton, who okay. in 1912 was working as a volunteer at the Natural History Museum underneath Woodward and really detested him, really disliked him. Uh, and he goes on to have a very distinguished career. He ends up as the museum's keeper of zoology. Um, and in 1970, a trunk that had belonged to Hinton was found that Hinton had left in storage at the Natural History Museum. And it was opened and it was found to contain animal teeth and bones that had been stained in a manner very reminiscent of the Piltdown bones. So why? You know, yeah. properly. What's the explanation? Properly mysterious. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, the, th the theory has been advanced that he disliked um, Woodward so much that he wanted to make him look an idiot. Uh, he would have needed to enlist the other guy, though, wouldn't he? He would. So that's the flaw in the argument. And so essentially, there is really only <laughs> one obvious suspect, uh, which is the guy who, who initially found the bone, which is, of course, the boiled egg-headed country solicitor, mm -hmm. Charles Dawson. Jovial. Jovial with a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Oh, no. Never trust um, a man and, with a in his eye. And, and he's always been the most plausible suspect. And there is now absolutely no doubt that it was him. Really? I mean, there really, there really isn't a mystery. So there are two brilliant books on Dawson that came out, um, I think, last 20 years by Mars Russell, brilliant archaeologist, mm -hmm. specialist in the Iron Age now. And these books combined conclusively prove it so i'll quote him in his his most recent book the piltdown man hoax case closed which absolutely does what it says on the tin so uh, russell writes the question of whether dawson was in any way involved in the piltdown controversy can no longer be in doubt he is the only person implicated at every stage of the fraud and the only one with the means opportunity and as far as we can ascertain in the absence of surviving personal correspondence or indeed of a signed confession motive and yet tom He's a tremendous fellow. Everybody says he's brilliant. He's found all these uh, yeah. amazing and very plausible artifacts <laughs> in the past. <laughs> right. How could anyone possibly believe this? It'd be sort of character for right. him, wouldn't it? Right. So, so despite the fact that that you know the scientists who work on the dig like him, it's clear that he has a very very unscrupulous side, and he has made himself very unpopular with Sussex antiquarian circles. So I mentioned the Sussex Archaeological Society. Um, he had had a massive bust up with them and Castle Lodge, this wonderful house at the foot of Sussex Castle that he lives in, had originally been the headquarters of the Sussex Archaeological Society. And they had employed him to negotiate them a better deal with the landlord. And he got behind their backs and negotiated a long term contract for himself and then evicted the Sussex so I have Archaeological to say, Society. I think, he's, I think he is brilliant. I love the sound of him. I think I, yeah, he and I would well, get on tremendously. So I said that, that that he didn't seem to be doing much law, but that I mean that shows tremendous ability to yeah. leverage uh, conveyancing skills. He should have been leading so, the National Guard in the French Revolution. So that that absolutely <laughs> wet weekend Lafayette, he'd have sorted yes. out. So so there's that, um, but there's also as you you said uh, all these finds that have given him the, um, the, the 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 moniker of the Wizard of Sussex. Yeah, and basically the stuff you know magic when you look at it, it always turns out not to be quite what it seems. And it's the same with his finds. So uh, Mars Russell has looked at all the finds he made and has pretty conclusively demonstrated that at least 33 of them are clear, clearly fake. What? So oh, no. In addition, so in addition to Piltdown Man, yeah. I, I mentioned the fossil of the Cretaceous mammal. Yeah. So the whole basis for thinking that this mammal is a new, previously undiscovered species is the fact that it, its teeth are, are quite worn and when russell went and looked at them it turned out that they had been filed down in exactly the same way that the teeth of piltdown man had been filed down so a, a, a deliberate fake and what's interesting about that was that this creature was cast as a, a missing link so it's um 
you know, very early on in Dawson's career, he's obviously already kind of moving along these lines. The Roman statuette, you remember that? That was made of um, cast iron. Yeah. The reason it's made of cast iron is because it's a modern copy. Oh, how, what, no one spotted this at the time. No one spotted it at the time because, well, we'll come to we'll come to how he's able to get away with all this in a, in a minute. But just to continue the list, the brick, the axe, the boat, all doctored, the mummified toad inside a flint. I mean, you said I don't know how that's possible. It isn't possible. I mean, it's it's, it's clearly not possible. It's clearly a fake. So basically, what he's doing over the course of his his career, he's developed certain techniques, and these are that, as with Piltdown Man. He always adopts a kind of studied vagueness as to, to where and when he'd made his finds. He's also <laughs> constantly claiming that the finds had originally been made by anonymous workmen. Right. Who then, of course, can't be found because he's saying, you know, four years afterwards, you couldn't possibly find the workmen. So that's, you know, that, that kind of obscures the process. He's also unbelievably skillful at roping in um, academics who can serve him as his dupes. Yeah. So Woodward would be the paradigm of this, but there are others as well. Um, and uh, above all, what he's doing, which is what every confidence trickster does, is he is giving the victims what they want to find. Um, because, of course, they will share in the discoveries, right? It's they, they'll share in the they'll discovery, the discovery, but also he knows that they, he knows the way their work is leading and he knows what they're anxious to find. And he produces yes, he, it. He's, I mean, I mean, he is he's very knowledgeable about paleontology. And so he knows that what British scientists want more than anything else is a large headed missing link found in Britain because for all the reasons that we looked at. Tom, this has given me so many half. ideas. And this, this is exactly what he serves up. Now, you may ask, well, what, you know, what is his motive? And the motive, I think, is very clear. He wants, like all amateurs, yeah. he wants professional status. He wants specifically, I think, election to the Royal Society, which is the supreme body of, of British science, and he wants a knighthood, like you, and so, um, uh, yeah. like me, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very similar. Very, I mean, I have a certain amount of fellow feeling for him, um, and so t I think t t he's he's come to realise that to have a chance of winning either or both, he needs something really, really spectacular, and this is where Piltdown Man comes in because it's you know the the, the origins of humans of humanity is such a massive theme that it would resonate sufficiently that it might get him the rewards. And Miles Russell makes, I think, completely convincing argument that actually he gets the idea for Piltdown Man when he was at that lunch with Conan Doyle, where in 1911, when Conan Doyle had told him about his plans for the lost, for the lost world, and they talked about missing links and eight men. So I'll, I'll read Russell. Um, he says, this was Dawson's moment of revelation, the realization that he had his big find much of his antiquarian career to date had been spent providing people in the academic community with transitional artifacts, missing links in the chain of technological development. But now with Piltdown Man, he's going for the big one. The ultimate um, missing link. And yeah. And he, you know, he has he has the knowledge to know that this how this will resonate with the the paleontological community. But he also, you know, he knows where to find a, a likely spot for the fraud to be staged. So the quarry pit at Piltdown is, is very expertly chosen. Again, to quote Russell, what he needed was an apparently secure sequence of deposits of the right age for early humans, a reason for their disturbance, ideally road digging or quarrying that would explain how the finds were noticed in the first place, and a landowner who was more than happy to allow additional excavation and investigation that happens on the property of someone that um, uh, Dawson is a friend of. So this is why he chooses the place that he does. And... The final piece in this jigsaw puzzle, Dominic, I mean, it's literally a jigsaw puzzle, isn't it? The shattered fragments of this skull with the mysterious thickness. Um, he has access to a large array of sources, both legitimate and not, because of his role you know, as uh, both a dealer, but also he's involved in all these kind of various museums. And we know, for instance, that a medieval skull with Paget's disease had disappeared in the 1900s from the museum in Hastings, and Dawson had been on the committee of the Hastings I think Museum. Dawson is. He so, comes, he's, to my mind, you see, unlike many of the listeners will think this is dreadful, but I think he's coming out of this absolutely brilliantly. I think he sounds like such a splendid person. <laughs> uh, but my question is, I mean, he absolutely should have been given a knighthood for services to hoaxes. <laughs> to, to hoaxing. Yeah, but uh, did he get the Royal Society membership and the knighthood? 
No, he didn't. No, he died before he got either of them. But he did so, die in the knowledge that this thing had been named after him. And it must have yeah, been so did. satisfying. Yeah. And there's that painting where he is the one who is closest to Darwin. Just imagine. So he's the one who's being... The, yeah. the, the, the glow he must have felt when he went to bed every night, <laughs> he knowing that he fooled last. the world. Love well, it. yeah. Or, or, well, possibly. Or possibly he's in a state of constant trepidation that he's going to be rumbled. Um, and, and that may well have been something that was kind of playing on him. Because there is one remaining mystery, uh, and this has to do with um, the cricket bat <laughs> right. and uh, Martin Hinton's trunk. And Chris Stringer, who we had on the show talking about Neanderthals, uh, absolutely you know, brilliant. He's at the Natural History Museum, one of the, 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 the great specialists in prehistoric humans. He, he has a theory that provides a single solution to both those puzzles. So his theory is that Martin Hinton had rumbled Piltdown Man as a fraud and was aiming to tip off the culprit and that this explains the cricket bat. He had basically deliberately planted the most absurd object that he could come up with. Right. And thinking that everyone would look at this cricket bat and say, well, that, you know, this is obviously, this is obviously mad. But to, to, to quote Stringer, Hinton had miscalculated to his horror, instead of terminating the whole Piltdown saga, this bizarre piece was heralded as the world's oldest bone implement. And I think that this reflects very well on the British public, that they like the idea of their prehistoric yeah. forebears playing cricket. Um, so I think that to, to an extent you were right, that it's such an entertaining story, such an improbable story, that we should probably salute the... Uh, the man who made it all possible. And to quote Miles Russell again, Charles Dawson, the most successful archaeological and antiquarian forger that the world has ever known. Well, hats off and to Dominic, uh, Charles Dawson. He was British. He was British. So, that makes me very... Hooray. I'm actually prouder of him and of Britain <laughs> at the end of the story than I was at the beginning, which is nice. So yeah. very much a friend of the show, Charles Dawson. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Tom. That was uh, that was enormously good fun. I enjoyed that a lot. Um Brilliant, and and obviously on this podcast we have an absolutely scrupulous attitude towards um, we do to 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 the facts of history. As listeners to our episode on the on the Costa yeah. Rican Civil War, will <laughs> testify. We would never come up with nonsense. No, today, perhaps, absolutely uh, not. A knighthood or a medal from the British Academy. Um, <laughs> superb stuff. Uh, we will see you. Well, we're, we're I think we should return to the subject of hoaxes in a future podcast because there are many many tremendous hoaxes which would be fun to investigate. But that's enough for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye-bye.